Hoy tenemos un invitado especial, Drew, presente. We, we would like to know a little bit more about you. Okay. So where did you study? What? So I, uh, as an undergraduate, I went to Cornell University um, in New York State in the U.S., um, where I studied biological sciences with a focus in plant science, um, plant systematics to be exact. Um, and then uh, my, my junior year of, of undergraduate, I took paleontology uh, 301, sort of the introductory course in paleontology at Cornell. Um, and it really changed my life in that, that I got to do, for the first time, hands-on research. Um, and I knew from, from then on that I wanted to be a paleontologist and, and to work on, on fossils like the ones you're going to be seeing today. Good. Nice. Uh is this your first time here in Costa Rica? It is my, my fourth or fifth time. Oh, the, la the last time I got my uh, wisdom teeth removed <laughs> um, because it's actually uh, your, your dentists are much better and uh, reasonable than the, the dentists. Yes. Yeah. Good uh, expression. Yeah. Good. So. Very good. So how are you feeling here in Costa Rica? It's, it's beautiful, I find. Um, I spend a lot of time working at Pilar's father's house, and I find that I'm extremely productive sitting outside um, in the sun and, and just sitting and typing on my computer. Um, it's a bit different right now. Boston, it has been raining for the last seven days, um, and then it's about to start snowing in about a month. So um, yeah. Yeah, Costa Rica is beautiful. Good. Nice to have you here. You are really glad to to hear your talk, and so I give you the Great. stage. Thank you, and thank you again for having me. Um, I'd like to start off by recognizing that uh, the research I'm going to be presenting today, um, I did not do it in a box. I had, a, I had a, a lot of help from a lot of amazing scientists from all over uh, the world and all um, from many different universities. So I'd like to start off by, by recognizing a few of them, um, particularly uh, Jim Schiffbauer and Shuai Zhao, who are two of my, my main collaborators in a lot of research. As a paleobiologist and a geobiologist, my research focuses on the intersection between the lithosphere, the atmosphere, and the biosphere. Um, and as a paleontologist in particular, I'm interested in the history of the biosphere. Um, generally speaking, when I do research, I tend to, to straddle the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary, the Ediacaran Cambrian boundary, um, which is this boundary right here. Everything beneath this boundary is about 541 million years old or older, and everything here is younger than 541 million years old. We can visualize this boundary using the international chronostratigraphic chart, um, which assigns names to units of rock based off of their age. Um, Costa Rica, I've been told, tends to have very young rocks, everything pretty much from the upper Cretaceous and younger. We're going to be talking about the Cambrian and the Ediacaran, um, all pretty much on the opposite end of the geologic time scale. These systems in Earth history are significant for a number of reasons, but most importantly is that they were a transformative time in Earth history, which saw the radiation of complex, multicellular, eukaryotic life. Um, first being the Ediacaran, or Ediacara biota, uh, which evolves around 575 million years old ago, exemplified by things like this guy, Charnia discus, or uh, Dickinsonia, perhaps the single most recognizable fossil from our Australia. And these, um, these were the, really the first time we saw complex macroscopic life in Earth's environments. Fast forward about 40 million years and we see the advent of the Cambrian fauna, the first animals um, that we would necessarily ascribe to our, our planet. Things like arthropods, like trilobites, things like archaeocyaths, which are related, we believe, to sponges. We see all sorts of shelly fossils, um, like this hyalith, which is a, is a mollusk, probably not too far removed from a bivalve or a gastropod. Um, and then, obviously, crown group animals as well, um, such as this linguliformian uh, or lingulate brachiopod. In addition to seeing these body fossils of animals, we also see our, the first um, 
or the earliest trace fossils in the fossil record, um, beginning around 565 million year, years ago with these very simple linear surficial traces um, to about 550 million years ago, where we see the, the advent of sediment mixing, or what we call bioturbation, um, where animals are digging down into the sediment, churning it up, aerating it, um, and, and creating a, a really complex um, near surface environment. At around 541 million years ago, when we see the, the Cambrian explosion, uh, trace fossils also take off and you get things like this, which is uh, Tracticnus pedum, uh, which, is the bound, uh, which is the index fossil that uh, defines the, the base of the Phanerozoic. Overall, all these complex changes occurring in the biosphere resulted in a transformative um, nature um, that transitioned the, the, the biosphere from this sort of mat ground covered and um, very simple um, biosphere to this more complex um, biosphere characterized by predation, by animal ability, um, by complex uh, um, mixed sediments. Coincident with all these changes in the biosphere, um, there were dramatic uh, environmental perturbations in the Earth system. Uh, these perturbations include, most notably, the, the largest negative uh, carbon isotope extinction, um, excursion in Earth history, the so-called Shuram or Shuram Wanaka ex excursion, um, where um, delta uh, C13 values um, extended to as low as negative eight per mil. Um, which is theoretically impossible. It is a huge, unresolved perturbation in Earth's history. We also see um, a number of, of low-latitude uh, glaciations during this time, things that we would call snowball Earth-type glaciations, where, where ice cap covered most, if not the entire, surface of the planet. Suffice to say that the Earth system was a dynamic uh, body at this time, and environments and animals were co-evolving together. So my goals as a researcher are threefold. Um, one, I, I work to improve our chronology of animal evolution, asking when different groups of animals and when different animal behaviors evolved. Two, I work to our, improve our understanding of the phylogenetic relationships among animal groups, um, employing, amongst other things, uh, taxa from extinct and stem groups which have no modern analogs. And three, I work to relate these uh, evolutionary patterns to those large environmental perturbations I described before, so we can better understand coevolution. I use many resources um, to, to, to fulfill this, these goals. Um, one of the main ones, and the ones I'm going to be focusing on today, are phosphatic fossils, or fossils that are composed of some form of the mineral appetite, be it flora appetite, hydroxy appetite, carbonate flora appetite, etc. Generally speaking, there are three types. The first type are what you would expect. These are fossils of originally phosphatic uh, shells and skeletons. Perhaps the most uh, common one today, um, other than um, us, of course, we have we produce phosphatic bones, phosphatic teeth that could become fossils. The second most one abundant one are, are linguliformian brachiopods. Um, they live they live in very restricted environments, uh, but they produce these these thumbnail shaped shells composed of calcium phosphate. The second type of phosphatic uh, fossils that I work on are secondarily phosphatized jelly fossils. Um, so these are, these are shelly fossils that were originally composed of other minerals, mainly calcium carbonate, and have, through a number of geological and diagenetic processes, um, been tra um, transformed into calcium phosphates. And then the third um, and final group of phosphatic fossils um, that I work on are secondarily phosphatized soft tissues, exceptionally preserved fossils found in what we would call Lagerstaten, after it's a German word. And these are, these, this is a, this is a multicellular uh, algae um, that is uh, preserved with really amazing preservation of soft tissues. So phosphat phosphatic fossils of the first type are generally restricted um, today to four groups. Um, we, again, we produce um, bones and teeth which are made out of calcium phosphate, 
Brachiopods in the, in the, the clade Lingulaformia produce uh, these thumbnail-shaped shells made out of calcium phosphates. And there are various arthropods that also precipitate calcium phosphate as a biomineral. These include the, the very bizarre uh, barnacle Ibla, um, which is very rare, as well as various crustaceans which, produce, um, which precipitate calcium phosphate in addition to calcium carbonate. This is very different than, from the past. Geologic evidence suggests that um, in the early Cambrian, which we'll be talking about today, um, in addition to these extant groups in green um, that produce calcium phosphate today, there were various extinct groups um, uh, that also produced these calcium phosphate shells. So this is a, understanding the evolution of these shells has uh, implications for understanding the evolution <coughs> of biomineralization as a whole. Um, the second type of calcium phos uh, of phosphatic shells, um, um, both are preserved in a similar fashion. Um, it most notably gives you really exceptional preservation of soft tissues. Things like fish mussels um, and uh, squids um, are preserved in this fashion frequently. These fossils are preserved um, in environments where we have a local enrichment of phosphates, either from upwelling of, of deep phosphate-rich waters or from sort of um, weathering a phosphate off of the continent. This phosphate is then transported down into the sediment and as the organism is buried and, and, and moves down through the sediment column, it enters a zone where various geomicrobiological um, microbiological processes con concentrate phosphate and allow it to precipitate uh, around and in the organism, allowing it to be preserved in really amazing detail. So these are, these are various fossils from my work from this time period. These are all soft-bodied organisms, what we would usually call algae, as well as some um, simple ancient animals, um, such as these tubular um, guys, which are, are candidates for the oldest animals in Earth history. Um, these are various spiny acrotarchs, which are um, what we would call plankton today, as well as these multicellular acrotarchs, which are have been identified as possible animal embryos and have been very frequently featured in nature. Um, and these guys here, which are algae, a multicellular macroalgae, which have been fragmented and, and preserved with the, this cellular detail. So main takeaway is these fossils preserve a wealth of really extraordinary data to work with. To make the most of these fossils, I use a, a, a variety of innovative and institute analytical techniques, which I'm not going to, to delve too much into at this point, um, but I'll just use an example. This is a, t a CT scan through a rock with a bunch of, of uh, bryozoans or uh, uh, invertebrates, uh, marine invertebrates. What you see though is using this technique that you're able to, to, to resolve various, you can see their branches um, beneath the surface. You're able to re uh, resolve data that you would not normally be able to resolve <coughs> Um, simply by looking at the surface of the, of the rock. In addition to CT, I do more conventional work with electron microscopy and spectrometry, X-ray and electron diffraction, and also, and I'll show this a bit more later, various ion beam preparation techniques. So the focus of my talk today is to, to look at three case studies of early animal evolution. Uh, three different groups, three different types of, of, of fossils, um, preserving, um, telling us different things about early animal evolution. I've arranged this talk in sort of an unusual way. Uh, we're going to start with the, the, youngest, um, the youngest fossils in the Cambrian, and we're going to move back to the Ediacaran, and we're also going to start with what are the, the, the presumably the most derived or the animals that diverge from all other animals latest. So that, to emphasize a, a very specific point, and that's as we go sort of deeper in time, and further back the, the, down the tree of animal life, things become a lot more difficult. And the, the reason I want to emphasize this is because we can, we can address these problems using exceptionally preserved fossils and innovative <coughs> analytical techniques. Um, that's sort of one of the main takeaway messages from my talk. So I'm going to start with, with uh, this guy. This is a kinorink fossil. Uh, excuse me. I'm going to start by talking about fossil kinorinks, and this is a modern example of a kinorink. Kinorinks, or, or mud dragons, are these small segmented worm-like animals you've probably never seen before. The scale bar here is 100 microns. This is, this is only about a, um, 
a quarter of a, a millimeter in length. This is a very tiny animal, um, from, um, which is represented by as many as 200 extant species today. The best way to sort of visualize kinerinks, or to, to use an example from a preapulid, this is a reconstruction of a fossil preapulid, which is a relative of kinerinks. Um, these are very sort of um, simple worm-like things, which have an introvert, which is a proboscis or mouth-like structure, which they in, um, extend and retract um, to feed. Um, here you see one eating uh, material off the surface. Um, you'll notice that this proboscis is covered by various little spines called scalids. Um, here's another example. This is, this is a little bit more paleoecologically um, correct. This is, this is one living inside a hole, ex extending out of it, and again, ex extending its proboscis um, to feed. Kinerinks um, are a little different than that preapulid. Um, as I mentioned, they're segmented. They, uh, modern kinerinks always have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven body segments. Um, their introvert is hollow, has hollow scalids, uh, which are these structures here, um, and, and a terminal mouth at the end, which you can't really see, but it's right there. Um, inside its head around this region, there's a pharnix, which is covered by little tiny pharyngeal teeth. And the, the scalids and uh, pharyngeal teeth are arranged in a pantoramous, um, meaning a sets of five uh, pattern. Um, if we look at the, the phylogeny of animal life, or at least this one, um, we see that kinorinks uh, fall right here. They belong to the Scalidophora, uh, which includes kinorinks, preapulids, and uh, luciferians, which are not shown. Uh, this group, in turn, belongs to the cycloneuralia, which is a clade resolved using sequence data. And they all fall inside the ectysozoa, which is this green uh, branch here, um, which includes essentially all animals that molt their exoskeletons regularly. So kinorinks are, generally speaking, similar to arthropods in that degree. Um, they, they periodically shed a chitinous exoskeleton. There are some disagreements about the phylogeny of, of <coughs> arthropods, and uh, excuse me, of, of, of ectysozoans. Um, morphologically, um, the, the kinorinks are generally um, grouped in a monophyletic uh, clade of Scalidophora with luciferians, uh, which are these sort of um, little tiny um, micro animals, preapulids, which I've already showed you, and kinorinks um, forming the, the, the monophyletic group. Molecular data um, challenges this a bit. It still re resolves a monophyletic clade of preapulids and kinorinks, um, but the relationship with the other um, ectysozoans are a bit controversial. The main sort of message from this slide, though, is really regardless of whether you're using this sequence data or this morphological data, uh, kinorinks are always resolved closely with preapulids. And this is an this is a, a interesting observation when we consider that the fossil record of preapulids is very extensive. In addition to having various potential trace fossils of preapulids, we have things like Marquelia, which is a preapulid embryo fossil. We have various uh, macroscopic preapulids, su such as Celcaria and Atoia from the Burgess Shale. Um, these, these amazingly preserved carbonaceous compressions, you can see it's introverts here and here. <clears throat> and also things like Eopreapulites, um, which is this uh, secondarily phosphatized preapulid um, from the Quanchin Pu formation from the Lower Cambrian of South China. So we have a very extensive fossil record of preapulids. But to date, no one's ever described a fossil kinorink. So we don't know anything about their evolutionary history, um, when they evolved, um, what their sort of their, their ancestors looked like. So to sort of, um, this is ongoing research we've done um, on the Quanchin Pu formation and Ding Ying formation in South China. These formations either cross or are directly overlie the pre-Cambrian Cambrian boundary. So any fossils um, from these key horizons here are about 535 <coughs> million years old. Um, um, the, the, this, we've worked a lot on this uh, deposit because it's yielded a, a, a real plethora of exceptionally preserved phosphatic fossils, including olivoides, uh, which is an o Olympia, um, which are described as um, Nidarians, um, something like um, an anthozoan um, Olympia is. So we, we had a good feeling that if we kept looking 
through this formation, as, as, we, as we kept searching, we'd find um, some really interesting animals. And we succeeded, we found Eochinorhynchus, which we described in a paper in Scientific Reports two years ago. Um, Eochinorhynchus, we believe, is the, the first and, and really the only known genus of, of chinorhynch from the fossil record. Um, you can see a number of key um, chinorhynch-like uh, characteristics. It's got a segmented body, it's got an introvert covered with scalids and a mouth. Um, these scalids are hollow, we can see that in, 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 in some broken samples. Um, however, there's a few interesting things about Eochinorhynchus. Um, first, instead of having 11 body segments, it actually has 20. And not only that, it is what we are calling an armored chinorhynch. Each segment has a, a, um, has a circlet of these very tiny uh, rectangular plates. Um, and they also have these five pairs of bilaterally arranged sclerite, these large spines um, covering the body of Eochinorhynchus. We can, we can show this here. Here's the five sclerites, um, five pairs of sclerites running down the body. Um, and also you can see a little bit more better detail, these various rectangular plates covering the body segments. So this genus is different from modern chinorhynchs in that it is invested in its morphology um, various strategies of protection, creating an armor that will deter predators. Um, we, we, drew, we made a reconstruction and we did various uh, phylogenetic analyses and um, Eochinorhynchus is either a crown group chinorhynch or it falls right outside the crown group and, and it, it is what we would call a stem group. Regardless, it seems to be very closely related to chinorhynchs nonetheless. Yet you see this, this very, this armor pattern with all these plates and these, these very, um, very distinctive sclerites, which there you'll see right there. So, um, to summarize the work on the chinorhynch, the exceptional preservation of interior anatomy and exterior morphology in this fossil allows for, for really rigorous phylogenetic analysis um, in which we can say chinorhynchs evolved between 535 and 525 million years ago, um, but in doing so, they evolved various anti-predation strategies um, which resulted in uh, an armored configuration. Next, I'm going to trans transition um, again a little bit further down the tree, the tree um, and a little, um, perhaps a little further back in time to look at Nidarians. Um, we're going to be focusing on um, two, two groups in particular. Before we get there, I want to emphasize one key fact about Nidarians. Um, they occur today and throughout the Phanerozoic, but in all cases, they, they seem to produce um, skeletons made out of calcium carbonate. There are two genera in the, the Lower Cambrian um, that are notable um, for their resemblance to Nidarians. These include Sphenophallus and Byronia, um, which are these simple tubular fossils. Um, they have been interpreted as Scyphozoan Nidarians, um, which are, are alive today, um, which also produce these similar tubular-like body plans um, covered with these sort of transverse um, and longitudinal ridges um, all along their length. To investigate the, the sort of relationships of Byronia and Sphenophallus with modern Scyphozoans, uh, we collected material from two sources. The first is the Kylie Formation in the, uh, the lower Cambrian of South China. Um, the Kylie Formation um, is known as famous for containing the Kylie biota, which is a Burgess shale type biota, um, which has yielded a, a plethora of arthropods um, in extraordinary fashion. Um, and we also, um, we also collected some Sphenophallus, and I'll show you the Byronia first. Um, Byronia here consists of these, uh, um, these calcium phosphate tubes, similar to Scyphozoans. They're covered by these low relief uh, transverse and longitudinal ribs. We then looked at Sphenophallus, which we collected from the uh, Suijing Tou Formation in South China, um, located in the Yangtze Gorges area. Uh, the Yang, uh, the Suijing Tou formation in this area consists of three <coughs> members in stratigraphic order. Um, a member one, which consists of black shale containing large, prominent uh, carbonate concretions. A middle member, uh, which 
principally consists of laminated organic rich black shale, and member three, which is a bioclastic carbonaceous limestone, which has yielded, amongst other things, possible animal embryos. Uh, the first appearance of trilobites in this section occurs uh, right about here um, with, with cyanodiscus trilobites, um, constraining the age of our fossils to uh, Cambrian stage three, making them about 521 to 514 million years old. Sphenothallus um, consists of a pair of longitudinal thickenings <coughs> separated um, by a pair of uh, transverse walls. Both the ribs and the, the, the longitudinal thickenings are covered by various ribs uh, like structures which have not been described in, in much detail before. And in life, these organisms um, are interpreted to have been sessile, attaching to the, the substrate with these uh, conical circular holdfasts and feeding um, from the water column using a bisymmetrical uh, feeding apparatus. Um, and here's one, this is one what Sphenothallus looks like as a fossil. You can see the two longitudinal thickenings here, and the transverse wall is very poorly preserved in this specimen. So we took a look at how, uh, exactly what um, Sphenothallus, how it was composed, um, and we noticed a number of interesting features. Um, most notably is that Sphenothallus in this section consists of three layers, <coughs> an interior uh, dark layer, a middle um, sort of lighter gray, um, uh, higher Z layer, and an exterior um, um, low Z layer. Um, this, phos uh, this, this organophosphatic middle layer seems to be glamular in, comp um, in structure, consisting of various microcrystallites of apatite. Um, at, but is covered interior, interiorly and exteriorly by these two carbonaceous layers. We did various analyses on this, this middle layer, um, and we, we, we showed that it is, while it is um, principally uh, organic carbon, um, composed of organic carbon, it also contains a good deal of phosphorus. So this, like Byronia, is a phosphatic or organophosphatic skeleton. Um, and you can... You can <laughs> Uh, Professor uh, Madrigal drew this for me during my talk a few years ago, but it's a good analogy. It's a, it's an, a good analogy for what you're seeing with Sphenothallus. You're seeing a, you're seeing an or, uh, a phosphatic skeleton wrapped in a tuxedo of organic carbon. Um, and if you look a bit closer onto the surface of this organic carbon, what you see are again those those uh, transverse ribs as well as these very fine uh, longitudinal ribs as well. So you're seeing, again, something very similar to what we saw in um, Scyphozoans uh, with, with, the, with these different ribs. So to summarize, um, Byronian Sphenothallus, all evidence seems to indicate that they're, uh, that they're related to Scyphozoan Nidarians, except for the fact that their shells are made out of calcium phosphate. As I mentioned before, there are various, only a few groups today that produce calcium phosphate skeletons. But in the Cambrian, that seems to be different. There are many groups that produce <coughs> calcium phosphate skeletons, which are now extinct. Like the kind of rink before, we're seeing an animal group evolve a strategy of anti-predation, producing a skeleton which protects, protects them from danger. Okay, so for the final case study, um, today. I'd like to talk about um, sponges. I really like sponges. I like them a lot. I'm not going to lie. They have a very interesting fossil record because most of what we would expect um, from the fossil record is that sponges would be the first animal fossils. Um, when, I, when I go about looking for sponges in the fossil record, I don't just start by looking for sponge bodies. As we know, most sponges are um, soft bodied. They have very little hard parts um, that remain. Um, however, there are spicules, or the, the skeletons of sponges, which are made out of silica, or silicon dioxide, or calcium carbonate, um, which could be preserved in the fossil record. Um, this is an example of one of those uh, siliceous sponge spicule skeletons um, in a glass, dem or excuse me, in a, a glass or hexactinellid sponge. So I, when, I, when I've been doing for the last few years is going out and, and looking um, deep in the Ediacaran for evidence of these sorts of, of structures. 
Uh, one place I, I looked is this uh, phosphorite mine in South China. Um, this is a phosphorite of the Ediacaran Doshan 12 formation at Wang'an. Um, this phosphorite is about 580 million years old, and it is notable for being one of the, the earliest economically significant uh, deposits of phosphate in the world. So when we go to look for fossils in this site, they're actively mining it um, for, pho for phosphorus, for fertilizer, so they can feed a billion people in China. Um, but this phosphate is notable because in, um, it is actually made up of phosphatic fossils. So this is one of those I've showed you before. Um, this is a multicellular acrotarch um, that has been interpreted as a possible animal embryo, but it's also been interpreted as a possible sponge because it con contains a variety of, of microstructures um, that have been interpreted, uh, uh, amongst other things, as possible sponge spicules. In this, in this scenario then, uh, these phosphatized microfossils are interpreted as sponge remains, and these acicular structures, which they contain, are interpreted as demisponge spicules or hexactinellid spicules. If these are sponge spicules, and if these fossils are sponges, they are the oldest sponges preserved with skeletons in the fossil record. Um, to investigate this possibility, we used a number of, of analytical techniques with a simple rationale. We can evaluate four predictions to test for this spicule hypothesis. First, if those structures are spicules, they should be composed of silica, silicon dioxide. Um, second, if they, are, if they are spicules, that silica should be amorphous, not crystalline in, in, in mineralogy. Third, in cross-section, these spicules should be cylindrical. <clears throat> and lastly, they should be hollow. They should have the remains of what's called an axial canal, which is the remnants, sort of the, the vestigial uh, structure from which the, the, the silica was precipitated on an organic filament. So we can test these four, these four predictions using a variety of analytical techniques, which I won't go um, into detail on, uh, but they range from sort of traditional a geological techniques um, rooted in electron microscopy um, to more advanced things like focused ion beam electron microscopy, which I'll show you in a second, and various synchrotron um, techniques such as Zanes and XRF. I'd be happy to talk more about these techniques later. But what we see when we apply them is, is that these structures are not what you expect. Imaging shows that these structures are actually uh, composed of a, a, a lower Z than the calcium phosphate um, that surrounds them, which is good. Um, however, they contain high concentrations of sulfur and very low concentrations of, of all things, silicon. Not a good sign. We also did EDS and we saw, showed similar results. High concentrations of sulfur and carbon, low, low to non-existent concentrations of silicon um, and apatite. <coughs> We applied some uh, more advanced spectroscopy um, techniques, including zanes, to look at the sulfur compounds which are found in these structures. And what you see is that the sulfur occurs as this um, form dibenzothiophene, um, which is a, a, a heterocyclic thiophene, which is frequently found in organic microfossils throughout the Precambrian. We next applied focused ion beam electron microscopy, which is a nanoscale uh, manipulation and, and fabrication tool, which allows you to really um, cut into your sample and, and, and manipulate it in really fun, interesting ways. This is my favorite example. This is a sand castle. This is a castle that has been carved on the grain of sand using an ion beam. It's really cool. It's really fun to use. It's very useful. So what we did is we took a fossil with a number of these structures and we just cut into it and we, and we looked at the structure in cross-section. And what you see in cross-section is that these structures are made out of a porous material, amorphous but porous. It is <coughs> rectangular, not circular or, or cylindrical in cross-section. And lastly, there is no axial canal. It is, a, it is just completely composed of this porous um, organic carbon material. To summarize, the structures are amorphous but porous. Um, they consist of a thiophene containing carbonaceous material and are not composed of silica. They are not cylindrical in cross section and they contain no axial canals. These structures are not sponge spicules. The oldest sponge spicules, if you, if you look 
deep into the record, like I have, are about 535 million years ago. This is long after the earliest animal fossils. Sponges did not evolve um, skeletons until the Cambrian explosion. This is surprising in particular because uh, various lines of evidence, including uh, silica uh, biomarkers uh, for uh, silica biomineralizing sponges, as well as uh, various time calibrated phylogenies or molecular clocks, all indicate that these, these group of sponges evolved um, around 700 to 800 million years ago. Um, but again, the earliest fossils of spicules we see don't first show up until about 535. So there's a 200 million year gap from where we expect to see spicules and where they actually occur. I'm not sure what this means. It could be, a, it could be our biomarkers and molecular clocks are wrong. Certainly that's a possibility. It could be a paleobiological issue. Perhaps spicules did not evolve until about 535 million years ago. Or lastly, it, maybe it's a geobiological issue. Maybe um, they did evolve, but they were just never preserved through this really vast period in Earth history. My favorite hypothesis is number two. I just can't imagine that they were there and we have absolutely no signs of them, given how, um, what wonderful fossils we have from this period in time. So I'd like to sort of leave you then with two um, main conclusions. The first is that by looking at phosphatic fossils, we're seeing um, really strong evidence that numerous clades of, of animals evolved armor right around the same time, about 535 to 525 million years ago. We saw that in the, the oldest and only kind of ring fossils, uh, which have these, these various rectangular plates covering their segments, as well as these five pairs of, of spines covering their body. We saw this in Nidarians, like Sphenothallus, where you have scyphozoans producing phosphatic skeletons, um, preserving, um, protecting their soft parts within. And we see this in sponges, um, which first evolved their, their siliceous skeletons around 535 million years ago. And then the last conclusion, as I alluded to in the beginning, I hope I've, I've convinced you that as we move further back in time and it further down the, the animal tree, things become a lot more challenging. But we can start to address them by looking at really exceptionally preserved fossils and by using some really fun and innovative analytical techniques. Thank you. Now we have time. A couple of questions. So we have to deal. What's a ZANE? How does it work? So ZANE is, 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 is an acronym for X-ray absorption near edge structure. Um, essentially, I, will, I won't lie to you, it's not my forte. Um, I, I was lucky to work with a, a few, of, uh, a few uh, material scientists who actually work a lot doing synchrotron work on nanomaterials. So really great stuff. Essentially, you're looking at um, how uh, structures um, respond to radiation um, along their edges. They, you know, you release different X-rays differently, whether your atoms are located near the, the sort of middle of your material versus the edge of your material. Um, it gets complicated fast. <laughs> yeah? Thanks. First of all, I would like to thank you because I am from the first year of of the of the career mm -hmm. and I and I want to be a paleontologist and I think the Cambrian period it's a very interesting part of our history because there is where a uh, vertebrates were well, sorry vertebrates evolved mm -hmm. and I also think that sponges and uh, how do you say the armored uh, worms Kind of rings. You, or you can call them mud dragons. I, I, I actually, I promised per, uh, Professor Madrigal that I would, I would call them mud dragons, but I forgot. We will know. <laughs> <laughs> um, sorry, go ahead. Well, um, oh, that's like a. Oh, well, I'm, I'm happy. I'm happy. I, I came to talk to you, and if you, if you have any questions, um, certainly I can give you my email address. Okay. Go for it. What about the CT scan? You said you, you did like in situ analysis, but mm -hmm. does that mean you just 
Um, does it mean you do the CT scan with the rock or like on the field? Or? Um, so what's nice, so I'll walk you through how we prep some of these fossils. And I'll, I'll, I'll focus on the, the kinery fossils because it's, um, Actually, I'm going to focus on the one ant fossils because I have a picture of the field site on my presentation. So we go to one ant that consists of, the foss right there consists of two facies, this very dark uh, black organic rich facies. It's, it's full of, of a, a keratin and bitumen. Um, and then this, this gray facies above it. Um, both facies, um, if you look at them, they're class supported or grain supported phosphorites. Um, with a, a matrix generally containing either silica cements or in the case of this gray facies, um, a, a, a calcium carbonate or dole stone um, cements. Um, so what we do is we go and collect samples in the field and we bring it back to the lab and we do um, acetic acid maceration. Um, so we, we are then able to sort of extract individual fossils um, for analysis. Um, the black facies is a little difficult um, because it's so, org so organic rich and it also has a lot of silica cements we aren't able to, to extract individual fossils. So what we do is then we, made pe we make petrographic fin sections like this um, to, to, um, to then man study and manipulate in various ways. Unfortunately, as you notice, I didn't use CT for this study as much as I would have liked to, uh, but we have um, amongst other things. You're able to extract fossils like these, um, which are, the reason it's black is this is an SEM image and there, there's just carbon tape beneath it, copper tape beneath it. Um, so you're able to pull these out and you can actually see these um, by putting it on the head of a needle. Um, so haven't mastered how to do this in the field yet, but maybe one day. <laughs> um, by the way, since I'm on this slide, nobody asked what I think those carbonaceous structures are. So I'm going to tell you. Um, uh, so, as I mentioned, you have those two facies, those, uh, those spicule-like carbonaceous structures occur in the black facies. These fossils also occur in the gray facies, but you don't see those carbonaceous structures. What you do find is these same sort of multicellular acrotarchs are, are associated with these various filamentous-like structures. Um, still some debate as to what these filaments are. They could be something like mucus strands or fungal hyphae or microbial filaments, which is my preferred interpretation. Um, but they all um, sort of um, are circular and cross section. Some of them even are, have, um, they seem to have sort of a, a sort of interior um, structure um, surrounded by these sort of isopacus cements. Um, and if you look at this interior structure, um, it is, um, which is rectangular and cross section, um, you'll see it's about the same diameter as most of those carbonaceous structures. Um, so what we think we're seeing in the gray facies is that that carbonaceous structure, instead of being preserved as carbon, is being preserved as this nanocrystalline apatite, uh, which is then, was then overgrown um, by later um, diagenetic um, isopacus cements of apatite, uh, producing these sort of strange uh, filaments that occur everywhere. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you, I'm not really into paleontology, I'm more like a mining person. It's okay. So <laughs> I, my question has to do with the previous picture that you had, the phosphatite mine. Yeah. So uh, do the mining companies realize uh, <laughs> what they, they have in there in terms of uh, yes. uh, in terms of mm -hmm. fossils and the import, uh, yeah, how so important they are for us. Really so good. are they willing to let you in the quarries and you take kind of support these kind of investigations in terms of letting you in, taking samples? So this could be a slightly long answer, um, <laughs> but I'm going to go for it anyway. And I would have I would have probably discussed this more if we had done the lunch thing like we originally talked about. So the full story on this is that People have been studying fossils from this mine since 1984. Um, they, this, this was one of the first places where they found uh, phosphatized macroalgae in the fossil record. Um, nobody gave a mierda. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they, they, uh, they, they sort of kept mining it, kept mining, kept mining it. My PhD advisor and now my colleague, Xu Hai Zhao, as a PhD student himself, 
went to this mine in 1994, something like that, and he collected a bunch of material, brought it back to the lab, did all those steps I told you, and found those multicellular acrotarchs, um, which look a lot like animal embryos, w which at the time made them the oldest animal fossils in the fossil record. That was published in Nature, and soon there was another paper in Nature, and one in PNAS, and one in Science, and many in Geology. It just, it was a very, it was scientifically a very important discovery. And the mine kept on mining. Um, now, not to say they aren't supportive. You actually go there, and there's a beautiful statue um, that they put up. It, it says, in Chinese, I can't read it, but I've been told it says, The Dawn of Animal Life, which is, which is a title that we often use in a lot of our, um, our, a lot of our uh, um, talks and books and, and papers, um, sort of in relation to this. But um, they keep on mining. They keep on destroying the rocks with all these fossils, and it's getting harder and harder and harder to go and collect material. Um, so I've gone several times. One time, I couldn't even find outcrop on the surface. I had to go down beneath the surface into the active mine um, and, and sort of sample. This is an underground mine. This is an underground mine um, with, with some surface mining as well, but mostly it's underground at this point. How um, big is it? It's huge. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I mean, I, I, this is sort of, I magnified this picture. Um, I wish I, I can pull up actual pictures, maybe. No, I, sorry, I don't have this on my computer. But it's, a, it's, a, it's an enormous mine. Um, and it's, it's, it's one of many huge phosphorite mines from this time period in China um, where they're, 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 collecting the, our, they're collecting the fossils for fertilizer, essentially. So um, at the end of the day, feeding people versus protecting these little microfossils. I think it's more important to feed people. But, uh, but they, do, they do support us. Uh, if you, they don't just let anybody into the mine, um, in part because this specific mine used to be a penal mine. So basically, they used to put send prisoners there to do hard labor. Um, so they're a little cautious about letting anybody in. Um, but someone like my, my, my colleague, Shuhai, he's been going for 20 years. Um, I've gone a few times now. Like, they let people in that they know. So you just got to kind of build up a, a good relationship with them, sort of um, respect their rules, um, drink with them at the end of the day, um, <laughs> um, and, and they let you in. Well, yes, because well, I think that not only in this country, but all over the world, um, it's not a secret to anybody that people don't like uh, mining to happen. Yeah. We know it's necessary, we, need, we all use it, but people don't like it. So this is kind of a good way to watch their faces clean a little bit. Yeah. Kind of support this investigation. Yeah. Um, so I mean, it's 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 a double-edged sword. Mining is obviously very helpful for paleontologists doing this sort of work because it exposes outcrops to start with. But then it it it, it 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 ends up destroying them. So it's it's a double-edged sword. Hopefully, you know, the main thing is if you you know phosphor, you can't really complain about phosphorus mining. You need to do it for economic reasons. Um, but, you know, the main thing we hope is that they'll keep discovering new deposits that we can keep searching for. So. Yes? So you mentioned uh, in one of your phylogenetic uh, slides that the oldest, um, the oldest organisms tend to, to use phosphates to create these shells. So what's what's the reason for that for that? Like is it that phosphate was more abundant or that the organism or all the organisms hadn't evolved into using calcium carbonate instead? Okay. So there are and this might be a little long answer, but I'll go through it again. Um, generally speaking, there are three types of minerals that animals use to produce skeletons. Silica Calcium phosphate and calcium carbonate. This graph shows silica today. It's a, it's it's a, it's a it's one group. It's sponges. Um, calcium carbonate, by far and away, is the most abundant or commonly used biomineral. Um, everything um, you really think of, if you go to the beach, everything you look at produces a calcium carbonate skull, whether it be calcite or aragonite, bivalves, gastropods, um, coleolids, um, um, coral. You name it, they, they, they produce calcium carbonate. The only exceptions, I mentioned them, we produce phosphatic skeletons, lingulids, and a few arthropods produce phosphatic skeletons. In the Cambrian, 
the numbers were skewed. Um, probably most things still produce calcium carbonate skeletons, but there's a large number that produce calcium phosphate skeletons. Why that is, um, I think it's two factors. The first, um, generally speaking, animals select a biomineral based off of the, the ocean chemistry. Um, as many of you know, the, the ocean switches um, from um, calcite seas to aragonitic seas throughout Earth's history and time, basically a change in the, the ratio of magnesium to calcium. When it's aragonitic oceans, uh, um, calcium carbonate producing animals generally evolve um, aragonitic skeletons. When it's calcitic oceans, they evolve calcitic um, shells. Calcium phosphate is different. It doesn't vary such on such a in such a pattern, but you do get periods in Earth history where um, you have elevated um, concentrations of phosphate in the ocean. So, a logical sort of interpretation then of this trend is that there were very high um, phosphate concentrations in the ocean um, in the, the Lower Cambrian. If you look globally at not just the 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 Ediacaran, but the Cambrian as well, um, you see that this is, throughout this interval, you do have um, widespread deposition of phosphorites. Um, perhaps the, the, the more pho uh, phosphorites in this interval than any other interval in Earth history, suggesting that oceans were um, saturated with phosphate. Um, this, this, is a, this is, I think, a, this is important for why things evolve calcium phosphate skeletons. But like I said, there are a lot of phosphorites in the Ediacaran. Why don't we see any calcium phosphate skeletons prior to 535 million years ago? And I think the answer is ecological stresses. So when you get the, when you get the evolution of mobile animals, you then, it then follows that you have the evolution of predation. Then you have the Cambrian explosion, where you have basically the evolution of all, essentially in a, uh, in a couple tens of million years, you have the evolution of all um, modern phyla of animals in a very short interval of geologic time. This evolutionary, a uh, consequence of this evolutionary pattern is that you have restru ecological restructuring of benthic marine environments, and that, and that, that, that structuring, um, that restructuring uh, drove a, an, what we would call an arms race. You can think of the, the, the Cold War, the US versus the Soviets, we won. Um, <laughs> Um, during this arms race, each one was sort of trying to up, outdo the other, and calcium phosphate was just one of many ways that animals could respond to the, these, these, these forces. Um, so it's those two things. It's uh, ocean rich in phosphates, and it's a, it's a benthic marine environment sort of conducive to this, this arms race. Um, so about the spicules that yeah. weren't spicules. Um, <laughs> You said you thought they were probably microbial filaments. It's one of, it's one of a number of hi hypotheses. It's, my, it's the one I like most, but I don't know if it's right. There's not a whole, it's a limited amount of evidence at the moment. But I mean, so, yeah. Why? Do you think that, is it like? It's circumstantial, which is why it's not best. The, the alternative could be that they're sort of um, acicular crystals that formed very early in um, orthogenesis or diagenesis diagenesis that were then sort of dissolved and replaced by sort of, you know, an influx of organic carbon. Um, that's a possibility. Certainly the, the rectangular shape of, of the structures is, is, is consistent with that. I, w I would hope, though, sooner or later we'd find one that you actually see some of the original mineral left, but we don't. And then that's sort of a third possibility, which is really speculative. The reviewers made us put it into the paper. Um, so hexactinellid sponges produce um, axial filaments, which are, which are square in cross-section, not rectangular square, um, but they're sort of the precursors to spicules. So one alternative explanation for these structures is that they're sort of precursors to spicules that, that were preserved and hadn't started being a nucleation point for, for silica yet. Um, no evidence for that, uh, other than it's a possibility, I guess. The, this, there's no evidence yet of a mineral, um, and the evidence for them being microbial is completely um, circumstantial. So uh, that is why I didn't actually include that slide in the talk. Um, it, is a, it is a part of that paper, um, which I will not have to deal with for the rest of my life. Uh, but um, do, you, do you have a thoughts on what they could be? Um, no, 
I mean, if you don't, I, I don't see how I could. Well, like, right now, think about <laughs> something. Here's, here's the thing. I'm waiting for I'm waiting for someone to look at them and be like, oh, I know exactly what that is because. Um, it, it, they're they're clearly not sponge pickles in my mind. They also have that weird. They do that weird. Um, they do this weird fascicle structure, which is again more mineralogical than sponge spicule. Sponge spicules, again, they have generally have consistent sort of shapes, um, how they branch and how their rays come off at a central point. Um, you know, this is very different than this. So, you know, it's not, I think they're very clearly not sponge spicules and I think axial filaments are not a good, not a good hypothesis, but they could be minerals they could, of some type, they could be, microbial filaments that have been modified in some other way. I, uh, it's a little unsatisfying, I know. Go ahead. No, I, I would like to see the other, the, the, the slide with the, the, the previous one. Um, this one? No. This one? The time scale? Uh, um, that, that, this one? That one, yeah. What could have happened six million years in, in earlier than that? in terms of the oldest animal fossils. It's in terms of the fossil record that is not good in terms of the, the structures were not hard because of the phosphate or carbonate. The concentrations in the oceans were, so were low. Or what could have happened that we don't have a good uh, fossil record for the animals in the earlier forms? So the earliest uh, skeletal fossils we see mm -hmm. are things like Claudina and Namaclothis, and they first show up in the record about 550 million years ago. So about, about here. Mm -hmm. um, so then the record actually goes far back. Mm -hmm. um, this is an older, an older figure, um, mm -hmm. and he didn't include Cloudina because we don't know what Cloudina is. And before that, were they were soft bodies and They're no preservation. Just soft bodies, and okay. we have trace fossils of animals going back another, a bilaterian animals going back another 15 million years ago. And generally speaking, you know, we don't know of any other organisms that evolved on this planet the ability to move or mix sediments. Mm -hmm. um, so it seems when you first see trace fossils, good trace fossils, you know that you have animals. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't have a, those preservational issues that you just mentioned. Uh, there's obviously a lot of debate with the Ediacara fauna. Things like uh, Dickinsonia has been interpreted as a stem group bilaterian. Um, and things like Spurgina, um, So things like Spurgina here has been interpreted as a bilaterian or perhaps a stem group arthropod. I don't think it is. It doesn't seem to have any of the, the right characters. Um, also, it's sort of, it looks, it looks bi with like it has bilateral symmetry, but it's actually offset. It's not perfectly symmetrical. Um, so I don't think that's a sound group an animal. Uh, there's various interpretations of Dickinsonia. It seems like you could cut it in half and it would be bilaterally symmetrical. But um, people have also kind of uh, compared it to placozoans. If you're familiar with placozoans, they're very, yeah, very obscure group of animals. Somewhere, somewhere between tenophores and sponges. Um, they're basically applicable mat-like structures. Um, no sim, no symmetry whatsoever. Um, but the evidence for that is very poor. You get things like charnia discus, which looks more algal than animal. You get things like, like triburchidium, which. Um, you get things. <laughs> you get things like Ernietta, which is just basically a tube. We don't ha we don't know what lived inside the tube. We just know that it was a tube. Um, you get things like Pteridinium, which is shaped like a canoe. We don't know what these things are, um, but we do know around 550 you have skeletal fossils. 15 million years ago you have bilaterian trace fossils. Somewhere in that time, um, animals evolved. Um, I don't think I don't. If there's a preservational issue with skeletons, mm -hmm. it is in that window, not around 535. Um. Talking about Nidarians, some people think that um, some of these kind of fossils are penatulations. Yeah. Sipens. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Um, um, the the, the, the um, axis is, is made of silica. Yeah. And the esclerites are made of calcium carbonate. It's possible, but, but I don't <laughs> and it's, uh, I have seen that in a book. That, yeah. that they, they, this, they, during the Cambrian, they have some yeah. fossils and they interpret that as a 
C pen. There are, I think, some reasonable C pen like uh, fossils from things like the Burgess Shale and, and Chenjiang, if you're familiar with those deposits. I don't think there are a few features of these fossils that sort of argue against that one. You don't see silica. It could be in some of these environments the silica was just dissolved, but in, in others you'd expect to see them. Second, you also have this very, and I wish I had a better picture of it, things like fractifuses here and charniodiscus and other fronds, they have this really unusual fractal branching pattern. You're seeing you know, five, six, or more orders of fractal branching um, in this organism, um, which you don't see in modern animals. And if it's anything, it's, you know, if we're going to try and interpret that ecologically, um, people have done models which suggest then that it's feeding via osmotrophy. So it's via diffusion of, mm -hmm. of, organic, of dissolved organic carbon from the water. Very, very unusual pathway. You don't see it. Um, everything, everything about these things sort of argues against that interpretation. Um, I'm not a fan of it myself. It could be, you know, obviously there's a lot of work to be done. We've been working on these fossils, in particular, 100 years, and we still, I still just call them complex multicellular eukaryotes, because that's the only thing that we can sort of say with, certain, with I think, any sort of certainty about them. Uh, also, you get these disc-like things that have been interpreted as jellyfish. It's the same sort of, it's the same sort of issue. Um, I think, I think, I don't think these are, are, are Medusa of any kind. They're, they're probably, they're either hold fast with these fronds or they're these weird discoidal animals that we, or you, mul complex multicellular macroscopic eukaryotes. I don't <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm curious about this at Arcusiatids there. I'm sorry? The number, oh, the A, the N, and O. Arcusiatids, okay. right? Yeah. Um, I don't know how you say in English. Uh, these are the Arcusiacs. Yeah, Arcusiacs. Uh, this, is a, this is what we would call a, a regular uh, Arcusiac, and this is an irregular Arcusiac. But I, I'm curious about the age. Uh, these are both from the Ajax mine um, of South Australia. Um, that's about 515 maybe. Um, there, there, there's some correlation issues. Uh, most, we use a, the, the regional sub-stages of, of Siberia, generally for the lower Cambrian. Um, and so, but there's some correlating between, um, between Siberia and South Australia is not easy. So I think these are, are put around the, the Adabantian or Batomian, which we put at about 525, 15. I thought it was the, uh, you found it in the Carrion. No, no, no. Oh, okay. This, this is Ediac. I should have, I should have organized this a little better. This is Ediac or Biota. <laughs> this is Cambrian fauna. Oh, yeah. Everything on here are almost certainly animals. Um, everything here, um, everything above this point, we don't know. These are all probably animals in some some way or another. Um, but not entirely sure. In this amazing site in China, you have that um, awesome microfossil of algae, but um, do you have something like a fungus? Um, or yeah, a I haven't worked on it myself, but they have described like filamentous like things as fungal hyphae. There was a science paper in there that now nobody saw at sites because we're not convinced at all, but they've been described. Um. Okay, no more comments, questions? Thank you very much, Dr. Docente. I think it was really interesting. We hope that next time you come to Costa Rica, you will give us another talk. I you are invited. And uh, at the same time, we are really happy to share this uh, auditorium with the people from the School of Biology. We hope uh, that the, our interaction will improve after this. So, uh, thank you very much. Eh, muchas gracias. Los invitamos a la próxima charla de Gabriel Dengo. Dentro de poco les vamos a avisar. Y gracias por venir. Esto es muy interesante. Seguimos teniendo charlas muy exitosas, muy interesantes desde hace un mes o más, ¿verdad? Y, y bueno, bueno, esperamos seguir con esa tendencia. Así que están invitados para la próxima y les vamos a avisar con tiempo. Gracias. gracias.